Hey, my name's Jeremy, and I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Shelter Cove. And I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in with us today. I firmly believe you're going to be encouraged, you're going to be inspired, but most of all, that God's going to do something through this message that's going to move you closer to Jesus. Thanks again for tuning in. Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome. If you have your Bibles, grab them and open up with me to Philippians chapter 1. My name's Chad. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Shelter Cove. While you're turning to Philippians chapter 1, I want to take you back to the year 2000. More specifically, I want to take you back to the NBA All-Star break, where Vince Carter from the Toronto Raptors put on one of the most unbelievable displays of athleticism and skill in this dunk contest. Vince Carter threw down five different dunks, but there is one in particular that I replay over in my mind all the time. Uh, Vince Carter grabs the ball, he makes his approach towards the basket, and then he jumps, leaps through the air. He jumps so high up into the air. He's like eye level with the rim. He sticks his whole arm down the basket, down the rim. And then as his body weight comes down, he just kind of hangs up on the rim and looks out into the audience like, you see what I just did? Uh, he jumps down from the hoop. They pan out to the crowd. There's this great shot of Shaquille O'Neal. And he's got his little video camera and his like jaw is on the floor. He cannot believe what he just saw. And I remember being like a little 11 year old at the time, 11, 12 years old. And, and it was like the talk on the playground. Everybody was talking about, did you see Vince Carter's dunk? I remember being so amazed how on earth did this man fly through the air? Like on the screen when he does his dunk, they have a, a meter that shows how high he jumped. He jumped 37 inches, over three feet of vertical. I just remember thinking, how did he do this? This is amazing. And I tell you this story because that same sense of amazement, that same sense of wonder I feel when I open up the book of Philippians, especially chapter one. Do you know why I feel that? When I read Philippians, especially chapter 1, what I find is that this text is dripping with joy. And that baffles me. That baffles my mind. How on earth could Paul feel so much joy? How could he just exude so much joy in the midst of his circumstances? Paul has every single reason under the sun to not be full of joy. He's got every single reason to be upset and frustrated. He's arrested on false charges. He didn't do anything illegal. He was just simply sharing the gospel and he gets thrown in prison for it, right? If he was in the United States, he'd say my First Amendment rights are being infringed upon. He has done nothing illegal, just simply sharing the gospel under arrest for it. He has opponents outside of the jail. They're preaching the gospel to rub it in that they can speak freely while he can't. And yet he writes the book of Philippians and it's like line after line, verse after verse, I will rejoice. I always thank the Lord for you with joy in my heart. You just see joy, 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 and it baffles me. How did he do this? How did he have so much joy in the face of such persecution? This is really the question I want to try to answer for us today. How did he have so much joy while facing such persecution? I don't know when you're going to catch this sermon. Uh, maybe you'll watch it during the weekend services. Maybe you'll catch it at a later date. Uh, we're filming this here end of May 2020. That means the coronavirus is still a very real part of our daily lives. If this pandemic has taught me anything, has revealed anything to me, it's shown me that the infrastructure around my joy is fragile. My joy gets shaken very, very easily. Like, what, I have to wear a mask in Costco? Like, Jesus, have you abandoned me? Like, Lord, have you left me to the grave? I have to wear a mask in Costco? Meanwhile, Paul's in jail on trumped up charges, filled with joy. I want to find out how this man walked in that kind of joy. Uh, let me pray and then we'll look to Philippians. Jesus, I ask now that you would teach us, illuminate our minds, illuminate our hearts, help us to see your word more clearly than we have ever seen it before. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. So the question on the table, how did Paul have such joy in the face of such persecution? Well, I want to answer that question by asking you another question. But what was the whole purpose for Paul's life? What was his whole MO about? Let me show you how Philippians 1 here reads. Philippians 1, we're going to pick it up here, middle of verse 18. 
Paul writes these words, Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So I just love that Paul's not a a self-contained, kind of self-motivated spiritual vitality. He's relying upon the prayers of his brothers, relying upon the Spirit's help for his strength in this difficult time. Um, that's just kind of a free point. I I love seeing that here. I love that Paul's so welcoming of other people's prayers and the Spirit's help. Verse 20, here's what he says. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. What was Paul's life purpose? Check this out. He wanted to bring Jesus glory. Paul's whole life purpose was to bring Jesus glory. He he says here, whether I live or whether I die, it matters not. All that I care about is that Christ is honored through my body. He starts this phrase off. He starts this passage off saying, yes, I'm serious. I will rejoice. That's in reference to other people preaching the gospel to spite him. Other people preaching the gospel to pour salt in the wound that they can freely speak while he can't. And you know what he does? He rejoices. He's like, I don't care. Let him preach. As long as Jesus is glorified, as long as the gospel is proclaimed, let them preach. I will rejoice because of it, regardless of what their motivations are. His whole MO is to bring Jesus glory. Now I've got to ask you the question, what is your life's purpose? If you answer this question incorrectly, you are going to be on a trajectory that will lead you towards chasing joy for the rest of your life and it will only elude you. It will only escape you. What is your life's purpose? Why are you here? What is your whole life orbiting around? What what is your main reason for living? Why are you getting out of bed in the morning? Paul found that if my life is about Christ's glory, there is a source of joy that comes from that, that nothing else can provide. Now, if somebody would have told me that 10 years ago, I would have laughed in their face. I would have said, yeah, right, that sounds miserable. My life's all about bringing Jesus glory. That sounds like a lot of lame Bible studies. That sounds like a lot of lame church potlucks. That sounds like some lame Christian music. I don't want anything to do with that. You can just keep that to yourself. How does Jesus' glory bring me any kind of joy? But let me try to tease out how this works. If, if you make life all about yourself, if you make life all about what you want, when you want, how you want, like if, if everything revolves around you, people, institutions, fun, food, drink, money, sex, work, all of this exists to satisfy you. You're the point of everything. Do you know what you're going to find? you're going to find that all of those spheres of life perpetually let you down. They will bring, at its best, short, fleeting joy, but they will bring no kind of lasting, enduring joy. Just kind of fleeting, uh, illusory pleasure, but no real lasting joy. You will put an expectation on things, on people, on stuff, to fulfill your soul, and they cannot bear up under that weight. And so you will just find yourself perpetually let down, you will find yourself perpetually disappointed, and then you lash out at those people for disappointing you. You lash out against them because they can't fulfill the unrealistic expectation that you have. See, Paul has discovered when my life is about Jesus' glory, I don't really know how it works. I just know that it works. It brings me a sense of joy nothing else compares with. Jesus said it like this. It's it's a paradox. You've got to catch this here. Jesus said, if you want to find your life, lose it for my sake. And then he gives the counter argument. He says, listen, if you try to hold on to your life, if you try to be the boss of your life, You call the shots. You decide how life's going to be lived. You are the boss. Everything revolves around you. It all exists for you. You make your life like that. You know what's going to happen? You're going to lose your life. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. Paul discovered this. 
I think this is a huge reason why he could have such joy in the face of such persecution. I don't care if I live or die. As long as I honor Jesus, my job is complete. Uh, That's the first truth that we're going to see here. I want to show you this next element of his life's purpose. Uh, Verse 21. This is probably one of the most famous verses in Scripture, definitely in this uh, epistle. Philippians 1.21 says this, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What was his second life's purpose? To experientially know Jesus as much as possible to experientially know him. Now, there's something about this text that has always bothered me. It, it reads clunky. Does, that, does it sound clunky to you? Like when I read this, it doesn't seem like it's good grammar. It seems like there should be another verb in there that helps modify the sentence. Like to live is Christ. That doesn't make sense. It, sh- it should be to live is to worship Christ or to live is to love Christ or to live is to follow Christ. But he just says to live as Christ. Why did he write it like that? Why did he say it that way? I think Paul's trying to cue us into the whole purpose of life being about not necessarily an action, not even necessarily a state of mind, the whole reason of life, the whole purpose behind life is a person. He says life, it is Jesus. Life itself, what we're meant for is Jesus. We're meant for Christ, the person of Christ. He's a real person, flesh and blood. He dwelt with us. God Almighty, sovereign of the universe. He came and was with us and our life is about him. We are made for him. Like I love that Romans 11 says that everything to all things, it is made for him, by him, and through him. Everything in the universe, by him, for him, and through him, through Jesus. You're made to be in relationship with Jesus. Anything outside of that, and you're going to just feel that low-grade disappointment. So Paul writes here, to live, it is the person of Christ. I want to know him. In Philippians 3, I can't wait till we get to this text, Philippians 3, Paul stacks up his moralistic religious resume, and it is a bulletproof resume. This guy is a varsity level, major league, moral achiever. He lists out everything that he did and makes him better than practically everyone on the planet. And you know what he says? I count all of that rubbish. The Greek reads more like human refuse. I count it all as trash. I count it all as waste compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And that phrase knowing in the Greek is the phrase epigenosis. It means to experientially firsthand know. Not just I have data in my head about him. Not just I know some facts or I can recite Bible verses. No, I I know him on a first name basis. I have experienced him. And once again, I don't know exactly how this works. I just know that it works. The closer I am to Jesus, the more joy I feel, regardless of my circumstances, regardless of what's happening around me. The more in step and close to Jesus I am, the more joy I feel. The closer I can get to the author of life, the more life I feel. It doesn't mean everything's perfect all the time. But but once again, I just have found the closer I am, the more joy I feel. Paul says here to live, it is the person of Christ. I want to know him. And then he makes this crazy statement, to die is gain. Watch how he plays the rest of this out. To die is gain right into 22. He says, if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. So if I stay here, that means God's going to do fruitful, productive ministry through me. People are going to be saved. People are going to be healed. People are going to mature in their faith. Good, fruitful ministry will happen. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. 23. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Jesus for for that is much better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. 
25, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. The third area that we see Paul's life dedicated to, the third purpose we see Paul give his life over to, is to help others progress in their faith. Paul has discovered a, a real secret to Christianity. He's discovered something that, that Solomon wrote back in the Proverbs. Solomon says that, that when you refresh others, you yourself will be refreshed. Paul has discovered here the blessing that comes from watching other people grow in their faith. He's discovered the joy that comes when you serve in your spiritual gifting. And you, and you get to help others grow in their faith, progress in their faith. I love the tension that Paul's caught in here. I think it's a real healthy tension for us as believers to be caught in. Like, man, I want to go home. I, I want to be home. Home is so much better. Heaven is so much better than all the shiny trinkets of this existence. But yet at the same time, I know that, that serving where the Lord has me, serving in my spiritual gifting, there is a torrent of joy that comes from that. So maybe one of the reasons that you and I feel kind of this low-grade disappointment, discontent, is because we're not serving where the Lord would have us. The Lord has gifted you as a son, as a daughter of Christ, with a certain spiritual gift that, that nobody else has. Right? He's wired you up uniquely to serve in a unique, special way. And I just want to submit to you today that the more you can serve and exercise that gift, the more joy, the more vitality in life you're going to find. Paul's life purpose was all about bringing Jesus glory, knowing Jesus as much as possible, experientially knowing him, and, and helping others progress in their faith. Uh, I love that this text says here, uh, that as you progress in your faith, that joy also increases. Right? It says for your progress and for your joy in the faith. As we mature in Christ, we should become people that are full of joy, not salty, bitter, cynical believers. It doesn't mean we put our head in the sand, but it, it should mean joy increases. This is his whole life's purpose. Now, 27 is going to shift gears. Paul's going to kind of move from speaking about his own walk with the Lord, his own internal state of affairs, and he's going to start instructing the church at Philippi. Here's what 27 says. Only let your manner of Christ be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So I want to pose this question. What's the instruction that Paul gives to the church here? How did Paul instruct his readers? He says, I, I want you to know something important. Live your life in a way that's worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, there are two incorrect ways to go about this. And then there's a middle road that's going to be the biblical way to handle this. Uh, when I say live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ, two wrong ways you can do this. The first wrong way is to make it all about rules, to make it all about keeping the law. To live a life worthy of the gospel. Okay, well that means we got to keep all the rules. We can't mess up. We can't screw up ever. We've got to do all the do's. We've got to don't all the don'ts. And if we mess up, then, then we're over. Then, then your testimony's shot. Then you have no chance at redemption. You make it all legalism. And here's why that's the wrong way to do it. It enslaves you back into the law. And what it's actually doing is usurping God's authority. Because what you're saying is, my morality, my obedience is what saves me, not the sovereign work of Christ on the cross. My good deeds are what save me, not Jesus' shed blood. When we go down that legalistic road, we're trying to yank control out of God's hands. The other wrong way we can do this is, is to kind of go what the Romans did in, in Romans 6. They had the argument, if if, uh, shall we keep on sinning so that grace may increase? Shall we just keep on doing whatever we feel like so that grace may increase? I mean, hey, if we are saved by grace through faith alone, can't we just do whatever we feel like? And, and Paul says, oh, hold on, that's, that's slavery as well. You're now just enslaving yourself to your sinful desires. 
You're now enslaving yourself to the behaviors that destroy you, that rob you of joy. So let's talk about kind of a a middle biblical road here. We'll just call it gospel-motivated obedience. It doesn't fall into legalism. It doesn't fall into uh, what the theologians will say is licentiousness, right? Using grace as a license to sin. There's a middle road here, and here's how the middle road looks. The middle road looks like this. uh, Knowing full well, Jesus has reconciled me completely. Completely. You've got to hear me on this. There are so many Christians out there thinking that they have to contribute to their salvation by their obedience. With all due respect, Jesus doesn't need your help. He doesn't need you to to bolster up his salvation. He doesn't need you to help add and help hold it up. He's got it done. It's finished. There are so many of us feeling like, well, well, if I'm not doing the right things, then Jesus hates me, and then God hates me, and then, then I can't be in right relationship with him. That's a hard way to live. So gospel-motivated obedience knows Jesus has saved me fully. I can just rest in him. But it also knows, as is revealed by the Scriptures, revealed by the Spirit, that Jesus' way of doing life works a lot better than our way of doing life. Life on Jesus' terms goes way better than life on our terms. This is where obedience comes into the picture. We can rest in the fact that Christ has fully saved us and now obedience is not, hey, you gotta do this to get into heaven. Obedience is more, I wanna follow you, Jesus, because your ways lead to life. Your ways lead to what is good. Uh, John Piper, this uh, pastor, has this expression. He he says that he's a Christian hedonist. And uh, hedonism is is the pursuit of pleasure. It's the philosophical idea that life's all about pursuing pleasure. And so he says, I'm a Christian hedonist. And what he means is the more I submit to the Bible, the more I order my life on Jesus' terms rather than my own, the more pleasure, the more joy I find. This is the the gospel-motivated obedience. This is the middle road, resting in what Christ has done for us, but also going, I will follow and obey because your ways are good and they lead me to life. Now, watch what the middle of verse 27 says. Paul continues on. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel, middle of 27, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. The second instruction he gives his readers, he gives us as well, is to be united in the advancement of the gospel. Be be united together. Psalm 133 says how how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Uh, There are a lot of different splinters and factions and denominations within Christianity. And and, and I want to just briefly touch on what does it look like to walk in unity, but to also hold to doctrinal accuracy? What does that look like? How do we balance those scales out? Uh, One of the most helpful ways I heard about this was was breaking theology into what's called first-order theology and then second-order theology. There are some first-order doctrinal elements that that we cannot compromise for the sake of unity, right? Like there are some things that, hey, if we're not on the same page in these first-order areas, uh, we cannot lock arms in unity because we're fighting different fights, I'll give you three real quickly of these kind of first order theological elements. Uh, Number one, that God is a Trinitarian being. These three in one. Uh, This is a hill that Orthodox Christians are going to die on. We will fight for this. If if we disagree on God being Trinitarian, uh, we're not going to be able to lock arms together in unity. If we disagree, secondly, on the the sufficiency, the authority, the, the power of the Scriptures... Like if if someone's going to minimize and downplay the scriptures, that's a first order theological element that that if we disagree on, we cannot lock arms in unity. A third one would be the person and the work of Jesus Christ. 
uh, if, if someone's going to minimize and downplay Jesus, if Jesus is anything less than God Almighty, second person of the Trinity, come in human flesh to reconcile man back to the Father, if he's anything less than that, then we've got a serious problem. We, we cannot unify together. We can't sacrifice these first order theological doctrines for the sake of unity. However, there are what's called these kind of second tier, second level theological issues. Uh, These are things like, what's your worship style? What's your worship preference? How do you view baptism? How do you view predestination? How do you view communion? Right? There's kind of these stylistic, almost philosophical preferences that the Bible's not really 100% clear on. There's kind of some, some room for disagreement. And when it comes to those secondary theological issues. Those are issues that we can be charitable with, we can be open-handed with, right? Those are issues that we can lock arms together with brothers and sisters that view differently than us. Because at the end of the day, we hold to Christ crucified, grace through Jesus alone. We hold to him being a Trinitarian being, the sufficiency of the scriptures. Those are major, major doctrinal issues. And so we've got to just be careful here that we don't sacrifice what's important doctrine for the sake of unity. But we also have to be careful that we don't make secondary issues bigger than what they really are. Paul calls us here, be unified for the gospel. The third point here, he's going to say, middle of verse 28. Right here in the beginning, 28, he says, And don't be frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction but of your salvation and that from God. He's going to call his listeners here to be courageous. Be courageous. And the reason's really interesting. Did you see it here? Your courage in the face of persecution is going to be a testimony to unbelievers. It's going to be a testimony to unbelievers that you really are saved by God. It's going to be a powerful testimony that they are outside the fold of Christ, but you have Jesus. There will be something about your courage that resonates to them. That person's really saved. And who knows what that could do in their heart? Who knows what that might spur in them? That's a really interesting passage. Paul's like, hey, don't don't shy away when persecution comes. Your courage is going to be a loud testimony. And then fourth here, as we get to verse 29, Paul says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in Him, but also suffer for His sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Paul calls his, re- his listeners to be ready to suffer. This point in the text has probably worked me over the past couple weeks more than any other point in this passage. Paul's calling us, be ready, suffering's coming. And, and God is not allowing us to go through suffering because he's a jerk, because he's a masochist, because he likes to see us squirm under suffering. This is what suffering does in your life. It will show you, even though these precious, beloved things of life get taken away, Jesus is still enough. Jesus himself will be enough. The person of Christ will be enough to satisfy your soul. And and that's been hard for me, because honestly, what what I've been seeing in my own soul, and my own mind, is that there are times where I'm more in love with what Jesus blesses me with than Jesus himself. Uh, I'm more in love with his stuff than I am with him. As Paul says, be ready to suffer. It's not a matter of if, it is when. And it's not because God's mean. He, he's trying to show you something profound. I want to just close our time with two questions here to to reflect, two questions to maybe steer your heart in the direction that the Lord would have you go. First and foremost, what is your life's purpose? What are you living for? The Westminster Shorter Catechism says that 
the chief end of man is to bring God glory and to enjoy him forever. The second question I have for you today is, which instruction Paul's laid out here? Which instruction might the Lord be calling you to today? Do you need to walk in courage? Do you need to start preparing yourself for suffering? Have you been dividing with the brothers over issues that are not worth dividing over? And finally, have, have you been walking in a way that's worthy of the gospel? Not legalism, not licentiousness, but gospel-motivated obedience. Let me pray for you. Jesus, thank you for this passage and this time together. Teach us, Lord, to love you and to know you deeply. May you be the sole affection of our hearts. Help us, God, to that end, and I pray you'd help us now to walk in a way that is worthy of the gospel. You are good, Jesus. You are so worthy. And I pray these things in your wonderful name. Amen.